Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Jones, and I've been here a few times in the past. Uh, my, I am uh, just a little bit of by way of introduction. I'm not a teacher, and I'm not an author. I'm just a guy that likes history. I do come from a family of teachers, however, and I think that might be where I came up with the idea of turning my interest in history into these presentations. And so I, I speak all over the place. Uh, uh, let's see, in 2014 I did 89 presentations, and I'm on pace to exceed that probably by a pretty good margin this year. Uh, so I'm, I'm just uh, speak all over the place, mostly in the Twin Cities, but uh, do get uh, outstayed a little bit. And uh, so I had a copy of my flyer available when you came in, and if any of you are connected to or familiar with groups that, that use guest speakers, I always appreciate if you pass my information along. So uh, my topic today, of course, is the carving of Mount Rushmore. Uh, I have a just to, it's uh, the carving of an icon, I call it. And I'm going to talk about that tagline in just a second. So, uh, let's see, Donna, maybe we could flip the lights down there. Thank you. So, of course, this is the South Dakota map and Mount Rushmore. We'll just wait till the lights get down there. There we go. Is that? All right. So, the, the map of South Dakota and Mount Rushmore sits in the Black Hills, which are in the southwest corner of the state. That's where, that's where Mount Rushmore is. Now, I called this carving of an icon, and before I get too far into the story, I just want to address that not everyone views Mount Rushmore as an icon. Now, when I think of what is an icon, it is something that is, first of all, it's very recognizable, okay? And Mount Rushmore, even if you've never been there, you see a picture of it and you immediately know what it is. It's also something, an icon stands for something. And Mount Rushmore, you could kind of argue that it stands for the first 150 years of our country's history. So, but not everybody views it quite in that same light. There is a, there is a group of people that view Mount Rushmore as a mutilation. And those are the folks that say, Nature made this beautiful mountain, and what did we do? We went up there and we carved it to pieces and put something man-made up there. Then there are the folks that say Mount Rushmore is a desecration. And, and I want to tell you the story behind this. There is, that, that's related to a dispute over the land on which Mount Rushmore sits. So I want to tell you that story about, before we get into the carving. First of all, there was a tribe in this area called the Lakota Sioux, and what was happening back in the 1800s, the white man was moving westward, and they were uh, encountering this tribe, and it was a very turbulent time, a lot of battles and so forth. So in, tri in order to try to get the peace for the area, the federal government sent negotiators out to this area and they negotiated a treaty in 1868 called the Treaty of Fort Laramie. And what that did was it granted a big chunk of land. It, was, it wasn't just the Black Hills, it was bigger than that. And it granted the land to that tribe for eternity. Well, six years later, gold is discovered in the Black Hills. So, that turned into a good old-fashioned gold rush. People flooding into the area, seeking their fortune. So, a couple of years after that, the government sent negotiators back here, and they said, they tried to, they approached the tribe about the idea of renegotiating the treaty. The tribe said, no, we like the treaty just the way it is. We don't want to renegotiate. So then, in 1877, the Supreme Court I'm sorry, I'm sorry, in 1877, the Congress of the United States passed a bill that essentially just took the land back. And that started this land dispute. That land dispute continued for a long time, and it was more than 100 years later, in fact, it was 1980, when the Supreme Court issued a ruling on a case that had been brought before it, that said that act of 1877 was illegal and unconstitutional. 
However, part B of the, of the ruling was, was not that the land should be given back. Part B of the ruling was the tribe was entitled to compensation for the land. Yeah, it's, you could kind of draw the, the comparison or analogy of if you own a piece of land and they want to build a freeway through your land, you receive compensation. It's eminent domain. You know, it's, it was kind of that concept. So, so then you say, well, how much would the land have been worth? So there were some calculations done. What was the land worth in 18... 77, and then you account for interest, inflation over time, add in the value of gold and other minerals that had been removed from the Black Hills, and a figure of $105 million was reached. Now, the tribe refused the money. We don't want the money, we want our land back. So then that, this, this, turn, this, is con, this land dispute just continued, and that's exactly where it sits today. The money, uh, I've, I've read a couple of different figures about if the tribe were to ever step up today and say, we want the money, it would be, I've read a couple of different figures, but somewhere between three and five hundred million dollars today. They continue to refuse to accept the money. Now there's another, side story to this story, and that was in 2011, 19 members of this tribe filed a lawsuit requesting their portion of the money. And a different court, it wasn't the Supreme Court, a different court threw the lawsuit out saying the money was given to your tribe, not the individuals in the tribe, but to the tribe. So far the tribes refused to accept the money until the tribe accepts the money, it's not up to the court to answer the questions of who's in the tribe and who's not, because we have those types of questions, and also how will the money be used, or if, if it's to be distributed within the tribe, then who, what portion should each person receive? The court can't act on those things, so they threw the lawsuit out, and that's where it sits today. So that's the story behind the land dispute that is continuing today. So now you think about this, this, this monument up on this mountain and you want to say, how did this come about? Where did this idea come from? You have to go back to the 1920s. There was a man named Don Robinson living in South Dakota. He was actually the state historian. And he was trying to think of things, what can we do here in South Dakota to stimulate the economy? His idea was tourism. What can we do to, to entice people to come to South Dakota, spend their money, and it'll help the economy of the state? So he was trying to think of, of creative ideas, and he read an, a newspaper article in 1923 about something that was happening down in Georgia at a place called Stone Mountain. Stone Mountain has, a, has sort of a flat face on it, and, and a group of people in Georgia were carving a memorial to the Confederacy on the side of this mountain. And, Bo and Don Robinson thought, hey, we've got some beautiful mountains here in South Dakota. What if we were to do something similar and maybe people would come to, to visit? His idea was to do something that represented the westward expansion of the country. So he was thinking of western figures like Lewis and Clark, Buffalo Bill Cody. So after he thought about this for a while, he, he wrote a letter in August of 1924 to a man named Gutzen Borglum, who was in charge of the carving, the sculptor that was working on the carving down in Georgia. And he said to Borglum, would you be willing to come to South Dakota and talk to us about this idea that I have? And folks, that's where the idea started from. So today, we have this thing called the Mount Rushmore National Memorial. That is the official name of the four heads. Uh, there is a mountain named Mount Rushmore, but when we obviously talk about Mount Rushmore, usually we're just talking about the four heads. They didn't actually start carving until 1927, and it, and it took 14 years till they finished, till they stopped, I should say. The cost was just under a million dollars, and more than 80% of it came from the federal government. 
450,000 tons of rock were removed from the mountain and the faces are 60 feet tall, which would be the scale of a man who is 460 feet tall. And today, more than 2 million people a year visit Mount Rushmore. Those are the kinds of things that fascinate me. This guy back in the 1920s had this idea to stimulate tourism and look what it turned into. I just think that's a remarkable part of this story. Uh, he was right. Now, before I, I have one more thing to kind of get into before I talk about the carving of Mount Rushmore, and I want to talk about this place called Crazy Horse. I get asked about this a lot, but I, so I just sort of want to talk about it up front and then we'll get back to talking about Mount Rushmore. But Crazy Horse Memorial is happening, it's a completely separate project. The only connection to Mount Rushmore is that the guy that started this worked on Mount Rushmore for two months before he was fired. So a few years later he went off and, and on some Indian land in the area he is carving this, this, you can see the sculpture and you can see the resemblance in the background. Uh, Chief Crazy Horse, and they're using, it's on Indian land, and they're using private funds to carve this. If this is ever finished, it will be far larger than Mount Rushmore. But the man that started this, uh, he began in 1948. Now, he died more than 30 years ago, so it's now his children and his grandchildren that are working on Crazy Horse. At the pace they're going, they have decades to go. So, I include this just because I get asked about it, but it's, it's, people don't sometimes understand that it's a separate project. Now, if you go visit Crazy Horse, they will tell you that with pride that they are using private funding, whereas, of course, Mount Rushmore was mostly federal government funding. And, and, that, and that you have to hand it to them. But on the other hand, you, you want to say, the only reason, you, or not the only reason, but one of the only major reasons you have people come visit yours is because they came to see Mount Rushmore. And then while they were there, they said, let's take a half a day and go visit Crazy Horse. So, so it, it, just separate projects, and I just wanted to sort of touch on that before we got into it. But now we're gonna talk about Mount Rushmore. We've got the four heads of the presidents. From left to right, you have George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. So, as I go through this story, here's my outline so you can follow along. I'll start by talking about that man, Gutzen Borglum, the sculptor. Then we'll talk about the 14-year period when they were actually working on the mountain. Part three is the finishing, and as I will explain, technically speaking, Mount Rushmore was never finished, so maybe I should more appropriately call this the ending of the carving. And then part three is what's happening on the mountain today. So. We'll get started with part one, and this guy by the name of Gutzen Borglum. Before he was hired to carve Mount Rushmore, he was already pretty well known around the country and even, even in some, you know, Europe and so forth as a, as a sculptor, uh, as an artist. And uh, he always admired Abraham Lincoln for some reason. And I think he... he uh, he actually carved or sculpted a bust of Abraham Lincoln that sits inside the US Capitol. You actually, to see it, you have to take a tour and go inside the Capitol, and then you can walk by this great big bust of Lincoln, and he sculpted that. And then there's another pretty famous statue of Lincoln that sits outside of the City Hall in Newark, New Jersey, and he sculpted that. He did not sculpt the Lincoln Memorial, although he competed for it and was not selected and was bitter about it the rest of his life. Uh, he would criticize the Lincoln Memorial. But to show his admiration for Lincoln, he named his son Lincoln Borglum. Now, the, the boy's name was James Lincoln Borglum, but he went by Lincoln Borglum his whole life. And Borglum was a complicated guy. But I also ha think you have to admit that he was a genius. I think, I, at least I think it's genius to take this sculpture and translate that up on a mountain uh, and, have it, and have it turn out the way it did. 
I think that's remarkable, and I think you have to admit that he's a genius. But like you sort of have, see frequently with people that are geniuses, they have complicated personalities. When he would get up in front of an audience and talk, people would be inspired by him. They would want to roll up their sleeves and help the effort. What can I do? What, how, tell me what you need done. I'm gonna, this is the best thing you're, I've heard, best idea, I want to help you. They would want to follow him. But then if you actually worked with him, he was very tough to work with. People thought he was controlling and he was a bully. And so you had this kind of Jekyll and Hyde personality going on. If you didn't work with him, you thought he was the greatest guy ever. If you worked with him, you thought he was a jerk. So, it seems like Borglum was never happy unless things were just in, in like a boiling over. Because anytime things smoothed out where they had enough money and they were making progress on this project, he would do something or say something to make everybody mad at him. And uh, it seems like it was never, he could never just let it go. Like we're making progress, we're getting this done, and, and he would throw things up in the air. And there was a group of people that worked more in, in an administrative role on the mountain, handled the money and so forth, and he did battle with that group of people all the time. It was just constantly. Uh, constant and so uh, frequently that group of people came uh, you know close in many times to saying I can't work with this man he is he's just completely irrational now one of the things that Borglum had in his life is somehow he was able to uh, cultivate relationships with US presidents to the point where he could write to the White House and say I will be in Washington next month could I get a, an appointment with the president and he would be granted that he could go meet with the president but almost without fail time and again he would do something or eventually irritate the president to such a degree that the president would say if he writes to us again forget it I'm not meeting with him anymore so he'd burn these bridges now <clears throat> money was a big part of this story and Borglum's relationship with money was got in the way of this project. In his personal life, he lived beyond his means. He owned property in multiple states, and a lot of times those properties were either in foreclosure or close to foreclosure. Uh, as an artist, he was sort of used to, you would sell some kind of a piece of art and get a big payday, and then you'd go for a long time without any income, and then you'd make another sale and you get this big payday. And his attitude, it seems like, was the money will come. I'm just going to live my life the way I want to live, and the money will show up. So that was his personal relationship with money. But when it came to this project, it carried over because what he would do is he would tell people that there were people that had listened to him and wanted to roll up their sleeves and help him raise money. And he would say, don't worry about it. I have a lot of wealthy friends and they are going to show up with their checkbooks open and they will want to support this project. Don't worry about it. So people would hear that and say, oh, well, okay, I guess I don't need to help. Even though I want to, I guess I don't need to. He, doesn't, he says he doesn't need the help. So uh, nobody was working on raising the money. But then time would pass, and now either they ran out of money or they didn't have enough money, and then Borglum would be bitter. Why isn't anyone willing to help me? Why, how, am I the only one working on this? Am I the only one that cares if we get this done? That was kind of his attitude. He, well, we, you told us not to. Well, you know, that was kind of the way he handled himself. Now I want to tell you the story of Stone Mountain. It's a big tourist attraction today in Georgia, but what you see if you go there, uh, it has, really has nothing to do with Gutzenborglum. Let me tell you the story uh, of what happened. First of all, there was a, 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 a group in Georgia that had the idea to carve this memorial. This group was the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Women 
whose fathers and grandfathers had fought in the Civil War on behalf of the Confederacy. And this group wanted to see a monument to the Confederacy. To, to, they were proud of their heritage. And they wanted nothing more than to see it commemorated on this mountain. Well, Borglum was a tough guy to deal with at, at Mount Rushmore, and he was a tough guy to deal with at Stone Mountain too. When he was hired there, it seemed like he did battle with everybody at every turn. You're going in the wrong direction. You're not raising enough money. This, you know, and, or you're trying to control me with the way the money is being used and so forth. And it was just, it was just getting to be a, a real problem. And the, and the people that were in charge of the mountain, from, of Stone Mountain, were frustrated with him. Why isn't this getting done? It seems like he's never around. He would suddenly take off. He'd disappear. He'd go to Europe to sell a piece of art or something like that. Why is he not here? Well, so they're already frustrated and they feel like they're not making progress. Then in 1924, Borglum gets a letter from that man named Doan Robinson. In, the letter was written in August and in September of 24, Borglum travels to South Dakota to meet with people to talk about this idea. Well, now for a second, I'd like to ask you to imagine yourself being a member of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. You're proud of your heritage. You want to see this thing done to honor your fathers and your grandfathers. And you're frustrated at this man who doesn't seem to be getting it done. And then come to find out, where is he now? He has traveled to South Dakota to talk to some folks there about the idea of carving a memorial to the Union. That was the last straw. In the very early part of 25, he was fired. And when you read the story, it's almost like, you can't fire me, I quit. I mean, they, they were both, so, both sides were so angry at this, that he just sort of said, I quit and we're going to storm out the door. Now, the people in, in Georgia thought, well, he's created some models. We will just hire a new sculptor who will come in and work from Borglum's models and finish the work. But Borglum said, no. And on the way out the door, he took a hammer and destroyed the models. Ended up being charged with a destruction of property, and he had to flee the state of Georgia as a fugitive from justice. And to my knowledge, he never set foot in Georgia the rest of his life. So, and then, so they did hire a new sculptor who tried with, didn't, didn't even have models to work from, and that person worked for a while, and then it just, the whole thing just kind of fizzled and fell apart. But then it was a couple decades later that they started over, and they dynamited off what Borglum had started, and then they, uh, I think, it, I think the, what you see today was finished in 1972 or so. Uh, uh, so it is a big tourist attraction today, but it has no, no connection now to Gutz and Borglum. So <clears throat> his idea, he goes to South Dakota and he speaks to these leaders in Rapid City, and he said, you're thinking small potatoes. This idea of westward expansion. That's, that's for the birds. He said, you got to think big. And he used the term a shrine of democracy. And he proposed the idea of carving presidents. And not forget these western figures. We want, we want presidents and so forth. Well, he also on that trip talked about how, you know, I'm working on this southern memorial in Georgia and if, wouldn't it be nice if we did a northern memorial in South Dakota as if somehow those two would, would complement each other or balance each other or something? Because remember, at that point, he had not yet been fired in Georgia. So he thought, well, I can do them both. Well, of course, then it wasn't too long till he <laughs> didn't have the North, southern memorial to worry about anymore. And at the, on that trip, he estimated that this project would cost half a million dollars and take six years and of course it took more than twice that long and about twice that much money. 
But the people in, jo in South Dakota heard $500,000 in 1924, and they thought, how in the world are we ever going to raise that kind of money? That, and, but again, don't worry about it. My wealthy friends will show up and help support this thing. So, oh, well, okay. So the next thing they had to do was find a location for this carving. And the first site that they went to, this was Doan Robinson's idea, was a place called The Needles. You have the, it's in the Black Hills and you have these projections that stick up and Robinson's idea was that they would carve in 360 degrees. So Borglum and his, group, his party went to the Needles and they hiked around and they looked at things and they came down from there and they said, it's not going to work. Um, I think there were too many cracks and the stone was soft or something like that. But anyway, he just said it's not going to work. So then they set off to find another location and they ended up coming across Mount Rushmore. And Borglum fell in love with the site immediately and he really liked it because it had this flat side. This is a before picture of Mount Rushmore. And he liked that it was angled to the south and east so that as the sun rose and went across the sky, whatever was carved there would be in the sun most of the day. He, that's one of the reasons he liked this location. So here's a before picture, and here is an after picture. I'll do that again. Before and after. Excuse me. So just to sort of sum up the way Borglum looked at the project and his work, this is a quote from Borglum. He said, American art ought to be monumental in keeping with American life. Mount Rushmore should be colossal in keeping with American achievement. That was kind of his attitude about this project. So choosing the presidents was not without controversy. The first three were pretty easy. The first one that, that Borglum proposed was George Washington. He represents the birth of the nation. Well, everyone said, yeah, yeah, you can't argue with George Washington. Sure, he would be, he would be logical. The next one was Abraham Lincoln. He represented the preservation of the union of the nation. He kept us together during the, and after the Civil War. And again, people said, no, nope, hard to argue with. Yep, Abraham Lincoln. Number three was Thomas Jefferson. Well, that was, me. people said, mm, yeah, okay. And sort of nominally the story is that he represented the e expansion of the nation because during his presidency, we had the Louisiana Purchase, which you know, doubled the land area of the United States. But then number four, that's the, where the controversy came in. Teddy Roosevelt. When they first started talking about this, Teddy Roosevelt had only been dead for about six years. And, a lot, and people were saying, well, we think he was a good president, but you know how it is when as time passes, Sometimes the way a presidency is viewed or looked at changes with history as time passes. Is it a little early to literally carve this guy's head on a mountain? But Borglum was a, had actually been a personal friend of Teddy Roosevelt, had campaigned for him, and he wanted his face up there. So this is a case of Borglum kind of just pushing his way through and, and, and got it, okay? So, so the, again, nominally the story is that Teddy Roosevelt represented the development of the nation, which uh, is related to the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal didn't actually get finished, in, I think, until after Roosevelt was out of office, but during his presidency it got a big boost. And so now, instead of ships having to sail around the tip of South America, they could go from one ocean to the other, and the economic impact was tremendous. It, in, you know, it's kind of like, well, it changed, the, from an economic standpoint, changed the United States from a w regional power into a world power. That's the story behind this. So that's what uh, Roosevelt represents. But again, there was a little bit of controversy, but it was a little bit of a case of Borglum just saying, that's what we're going to do, and nobody was willing to take him on. So. Now I'm going to talk about the 14-year uh, the, the, the period when they were working on the mountain. The first thing that had to happen was Borglum created a scale model. 
If you visit Mount Rushmore today, you can't actually go up on the mountain, but you walk, walk around the base, and there's a building that you can walk through called the Sculptor's Studio, and it's the building where Borglum worked. And the scale model sits in there, and it's pretty interesting. They, you know, there's, there's like a little fence around it, so you can't get too close to it. But you can look at the model, and then right next to it is a whole wall full of windows that just looks right up at the heads on the mountain. And so you, it's pretty dramatic to kind of sit there and think about this. Um, the scale model is one inch on the model, was the equivalent of one foot up on the mountain. So it is a one twelfth scale. But as they were, the, as they were you know, removing rock and getting down to the, to the head, shaping the heads and so forth, the, the men sometimes would come down from the mountain and tell Borglum that there are cracks or you know, we gotta, this isn't going to work the way you have it laid out. So he would have to frequently go to the model and, and tweak it, change positions and so forth. Uh, and so, so on. But this is the scale model which you can actually see if you visit Mount Rushmore. Um, now as you see, the, the four men were supposed to be carved down to their waists. So when I talked about it was never finished, that's part of it. I'll come back to that later. But you start with this mountain which has this gray, weathered, dirty rock on the outside. And you have to remove the rock to get down to the white granite that, that can be shaped and it's solid and so forth. So they, would, they started by using dynamite. Large you know, sheets of rock removed from the mountain and most of the rock that was ever removed actually was done so with dynamite. Then it was the next thing was to start to shape the heads and they would use jackhammers. And then when it came down to the fine finishing, the shaping of the cheekbones and the eye sockets and all that kind of thing, they were using uh, pneumatic drills and so forth. And the idea was to, in, in layers as they get closer down. And I, I, always, I always like to think about, you know, you, you can never, you can always remove a little more rock, but <laughs> you can't, if you remove too much, you got a problem. And that would be my problem. But now, <clears throat> The working conditions. Now you can see there's some, a picture of some men hanging in these little things. looks like a swing from a swing set over the side of the mountain. They were paid the rate of a starting out per guy would get 50 cents an hour and if you were uh, more experienced and you were the one they trusted with that fine feature shaping and so forth, you'd be paid a dollar and a half an hour, which probably wasn't too bad in the 1930s. And I don't think there was anything in those days called OSHA. Steel-toed boots, hats, hard hats, nothing like that. They're up there hanging there, carving up here. And I was, here's another th interesting thing about this. So they would, they would get lowered down from the top of the mountain and they're, they're hanging in these slings or swings. And then they would have to maneuver this jackhammer which weighed between 20 and 60 pounds. So just think about trying to you don't have anywhere to brace your feet and so forth and you have to lift this thing up and operate this direction. It's different, we see jackhammers this way all the time, but now you're defying gravity. Plus, because you're hanging in the air, you put a jackhammer on the rock and you turn it on and the first thing it does is push you away from the mountain. So these guys had to figure out how to brace their feet so that they could drill down in. And it's almost an athletic feat, I would say. Uh, to think about that. Uh, <clears throat> another thing was when they got to the mountain they would arrive at the bottom and you had to go to the top to be lowered down. So the first thing, and there was no elevator for the first nine years, so the first thing you have to do on your work day, you arrive at work and the first thing you have to do is walk up a 40 story, 40 -story building. Once you're at the top, now you're ready to start your work day. So uh, that was what they had to encounter for the first several years. Another thing that I've read about from the men that, that, that actually did the carving is they talked about how in this hot summer the granite would absorb the sun's heat. So now they're hanging there and they're trying to carve and do all their things and the granite was too hot to touch because it had absorbed so much of the sun's heat. 
<clears throat> During that 14 year period, they encountered numerous work stoppages. They would run out of money. Everyone gets laid off, and then the call would, they'd get some more money, the call would go out and the men would show up again to work. Um, plus, Borglum, this complicated guy, had a history of getting mad at people and he would fire them and then the next day he'd hire them back. Time and again, and there was actually a woman who worked on the mountain as Borglum's personal secretary, personal assistant, and she, in later life she, she talked about this and he, she said, I stopped counting at 17 the number of times that he fired me and then rehired me the next day. That's a tough guy to work for. Now, there were really only two accidents of any note on this project, uh, and they were not life-threatening injuries. No one died carving Mount Rushmore, and that's pretty remarkable, I think. Now, there is a, a, a sad postscript to this, and that is that Many of the men that were doing the carving developed silicosis from inhaling all of this granite dust as it's being removed. And so what happened was, as I understand it, is the men were issued masks, but it was optional. And the men didn't like the masks. They were bulky or they were hot or something, so most of them didn't wear the masks. And then later in life, they, they developed these breathing problems from inhaling all this all this granite dust, and, and some of them, a couple of them died from it. Now, <clears throat> money. You can't talk about this story without talking about money. Uh, throughout the whole project, the funding was very erratic. They would get a chunk of money, burn through that, and then they'd be out of money. And then they'd have to get some more, and they'd run out of it, and so forth. And, and it was getting to be uh, very complicated, but because they would continually run out of money, they were actually shut down for more than half of those 14 years. So 1925, and remember the timing, they didn't actually start carving till 27, but 24 is when Borglum made his first trip there. So now he's back in South Dakota in 25, and he's giving speeches and he's telling everyone, this project will be privately funded, back, back to his wealthy friends. And of course, it wasn't true, didn't turn out to be true, so, so no one was doing anything to raise any money, and so now it's 1927, and we're finally, you know, maybe thinking we need to start, start get this project going if we're ever going to, and by the way, we've only raised, we've raised less than $10,000, because no one's really working on it. But, okay, so we'll go ahead and get started, 1927. They didn't start till October, and then by December they were already out of money. And it was getting to be winter, and they, they pretty much, most, they didn't do much work in the winter during this story anyway, but they were out of money already. Well, 1928 rolls around, and they don't have any money, so nothing was done on, the, on Mount Rushmore in 1928. 1929 rolls around, no money. And then finally, in June of 29, some money was allocated. And that was allowing them to get started again. So they, think about that. They worked for two months, and then they were shut down for more than a year and a half. Now, that June of 1929 allocation, which came from Congress, that ended up being a really important uh, part in the, the future of Mount Rushmore. First of all, that was the first time they said the name shall be the Mount Rushmore National Memorial. That's where it came from. It also said that admission to view this mountain shall be free forever. October of 29, the stock market crashes. Now, if you want to look for a silver lining in this, the silver lining would be the money was allocated in June before the stock market crashed. So essentially Congress said we've already allocated the money, we will honor it, we'll stand by that. But of course if the stock market had crashed before the money was allocated, I, I can see easily a scenario where Congress would have said, no, 
We don't have money to carve a mountain in rural South Dakota. What do we, we got bigger fish to fry here. We got bigger problems. So, so if you're looking for a silver lining, it was that this June of 29 allocation happened before we entered the depression. Now, during the 30s, the heart of this project, you continued to still have erratic funding, but there were a couple of years where they had fairly solid funding and they made substantial progress during those couple of those years. But all in all, this thing was never fully funded. So the people that worked on the mountain in an administrative role had to keep going back to Congress and asking for more money. And Congress was getting tired of it. These people from South Dakota, we give them some money, and then they show up the next year or six months later and they ask for more money. Is this ever going to end? Is this ever going to be finished? They were just getting worn down. <clears throat> But one of the things that was helping the cause of the people from South Dakota was that we did this to stimulate tourism and people are starting to show up. It's working. Uh, one of the big factors was that they now had better roads in this area. When they started carving, there was no road to get to Mount Rushmore. You had to take a trail through the woods. But now they had built some roads so people could drive there. And in 1930, there was a dedication ceremony of George Washington's face. Well, that was the first time you could reach the mountain by car. And <clears throat> one of the things that they did in the Black Hills is called the Iron Mountain Road. And it, they, it's really fascinating because they did a bunch of things like that picture more of a present day picture, but you're going to come around a bend and then they're framed in a, almost in a picture frame like is Mount Rushmore. And this, there's several spots where you can see that. And by the way, Borglum's son, Lincoln, who was working on the mountain with his father, was taking photographs of the work. And those photographs were being distributed across the country, reprinted in magazines and newspapers, and people around the country were seeing this thing and saying, wow, this sounds pretty neat. Let's go see it ourselves. So people were starting to show up. So that helped the cause, uh, the case for the people that were working on the money part of this thing. So now I'm on to part three. And again, as I said, Mount Rushmore was never finished, but uh, um, I'll call it, maybe I should be calling this the ending of the carving, but uh, during, as they went along, they would hold dedication ceremonies for the, each of the heads. The first one to be dedicated was George Washington, and it was done on the 4th of July. And they, they uh, had someone put together a gigantic American flag that hung from over the mountain and covered his head. And there were thousands of people that actually showed up to be part of this ceremony. And then at the, at the signal, they pulled the flag aside to unveil George Washington's head. Thomas Jefferson was dedicated in 1936. And the reason they chose this date was because President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was in South Dakota. And they said, let's have him come and participate in the ceremony, which will unveil Thomas Jefferson's head. Then Abraham Lincoln's was next, the one to be dedicated, and that was the 100, uh, 150th anniversary of the Constitution. And then Teddy Roosevelt was dedicated on the 50th anniversary of South Dakota statehood. And so this is kind of an example of Borglum using these events to generate publicity or tying them to you know, the president being there or specific anniversaries which would make people want to show up and want to participate and then the more people that showed up who would go home and tell people or pictures would be distributed and so forth. So it was a kind of a public, public relations uh, thing and he was pretty good at that. And now, we're getting into what we now know are the last two years. Uh, Borglum didn't think he was anywhere close to being done, but during the 40s, during 1940, there was a, an allocation from Congress of $86,000. And the request was for more than $300,000. So Congress said, here's $86,000, and by the way, we're just about on the brink of entering World War II. 
so we don't have money to keep funding this thing. This is it. They, they pretty much said, this is the last money you're going to get. Well, the people that were working on the administrative part of Mount Rushmore started to put some pressure on Borglum. You got to finish the faces. You see, even though they'd had dedication ceremonies, there was still a little bit of fine finishing work to be done, and they were, the, they were worried if something happens to Borglum, you'll have these unfinished faces that forever people will show up to look at these unfinished faces. Maybe you can't get all down to their waists and so forth, but at least get the heads done. That, so they really pressured him, and so he, you know, begrudgingly went along with that. And then he died suddenly in March of 41, and that was it. So during 1941, uh, Lincoln Borglum, who had worked there the whole time with his father, he took over, and they did some, they, and they worked until the money ran out, just did some fine finishing, and then they proceeded to dismantle the buildings and all the other things that had gone into creating this. And the last day of work was October 31st of 1941. Now, <clears throat> 2016, next year, will be the 75th anniversary of that date. So I think you will probably hear something about this in the news and so forth. But interestingly, they, even though they had dedications of the heads as they kind of went along, there was no dedication ceremony held in 1941. So they, didn't, they just didn't do anything. They just sort of stopped working and, and it was now a tourist attraction in its state. Um, there was a, another dedication ceremony held in 1998 and it was connected to something else that went on I'll talk about but um, but there was really no say okay we're done this is it this is all that's ever going to be let's have a dedication ceremony they didn't do that now <clears throat> I said Mount Rushmore was unfinished of course with the, the, you can see they were to be carved down to their waists. another thing that was never finished was something called the Hall of Records Borglum had this idea. He, he was aware of some places around the world, like you might have heard of Stonehenge or Easter Island, where there are these rock formations or these sculptures, and people today speculate who did this and what does it mean and so forth, and we have a lot of ideas, but in the end we don't really know who did it and why. Borglum said, felt we owe it to the future to tell the future, who are these four men, who worked on this, and why, and when, and what does it mean? So his idea was to create something called the Hall of Records. Now, we're looking at Mount Rushmore kind of from the side, and behind Abraham Lincoln's head is what looks like a door, door frame. And that is what it looks like today. It's not accessible to the general public, but Borglum's idea was that they would drill into this mountain peak behind Lincoln's head and they would essentially sort of hollow out this mountain. And then they, then they would build a grand staircase that tourists could walk up and go into the Hall of Records and you would see carved copies of the Declaration of Independence, the, the Constitution, there would be busts and statues of other presidents and so forth talking about the history of the United States. Well. So they actually started carving it, and they, even though it looks like a doorway, it only goes in a few feet. That's as far as they got. Uh, and they didn't finish it. So, but the Hall of Records was Borglum's idea. So, now, when Borglum died, his family was offered the option of burying him at Mount Rushmore. And the family declined. They said, he will never rest in peace lying next to his unfinished piece of work. <laughs> so he's buried at Forest Lawn in California. So, on to the last part here now. Uh, so, just a little bit about things today. First of all, I talked about this before, more than two million people a year show up to, to see Mount Rushmore. In 1998, a brand new visitor center and parking ramp were built. Now, that, I was there about two years ago, I think it was, 
And the visitor center is beautiful. It's got a museum that tells the same story I've been telling, and it's got a um, restaurant, and of course I got a gift shop or two, and so forth. But um, it, it's a beautiful thing. And then they built a parking ramp, and parking had always been a problem up there. And the, the area is managed by the National Park Service today. And when they built the parking ramp, they said, well, admission to view the mountain is free, but now you have to pay to park your car. And a lot of people, this was controversial because a lot of people said, isn't this a backdoor way of, carving, of charging an admission fee? Because let's face it, you drive this windy road and you get up there, there's nowhere else to park. It isn't like you can park at the strip mall across the street and walk over and look at it. You have to park in their ramp. Well, it, it, it stood up, and so today there is a parking fee. Uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, a man told me a story that I had never heard before, and I've been unable to verify it, but I'll share it with you. He said that when this was unveiled, the, 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 the statement was, when the loans are paid off, then the parking fee will go away. Anybody want to take guesses on how likely that is to happen? I don't think it's probably going to happen. There will always be another reason to keep it doing it. So anyway, uh, now, <clears throat> in order to keep the monument there for future generations, maintenance is done every year. In 1991, there was a very extensive survey done, and they were able to identify uh, some cracks in the monument, and then they classified them uh, so that, because they want to be careful of, uh, you know, if you have a crack, water gets in there, and then you have the freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw thing, and pretty soon it has turned into something bigger, and it's a problem. So every fall, they go up there and they, they, these guys rappel around and, and measure these cracks and look at them and so forth, and then they fill the cracks with silicone sealant, just trying to keep the water out. <clears throat> now, just a, a few interesting things about Mount Rushmore that you may or may not know or you may not see when you look at the mountain, but maybe it just shedding it a little different light. One of the first things is if you look at Mount Rushmore as a work of art, a lot of people comment about what Borglum did with the eyes. If you look at a lot of statues, the sculptor does it with these smooth eyeballs and people think they look kind of lifeless. Borglum decided to do something different and in each one of the eight eyeballs there's a column of granite that sticks out and the end of the column of granite becomes the pupil of the eye and as the sun goes across the sky, people think it looks like the eyes are alive. So a lot of people, again, as, when you're looking at it as a, piece, as a work of art, um, that's a comment that a lot of people make. Another thing is that when they started out, Thomas Jefferson was supposed to be on the other side of George Washington. They got started. They got a ways into it, and they, came, they said, this isn't going to work. There are too many cracks in the granite over here. So what they ended up doing was dynamited off what they had started. Borglum had to go back to his model and move Jefferson to the other side of Washington and start over. So if you, go, you look at it today, you don't see any, resemble, any, anything, any remnants of Jefferson's first head. <laughs> it's kind of a strange phrase. Um, Another thing, if you look closely at the, at the four presidents, it seems like George, Thomas Jefferson was carved based, that he's a younger man than the other three. Well, there's a story here, and it's a story that I will repeat, and I, I'm going to be up front that I've, I have read in one or two spots. People say, oh, no, no, you don't, that's not really how it happened, but it's been repeated many times, so I will repeat the story for you today. Uh, it was fairly customary for a prominent person like this to have a, a life mask done. So you'd take this impression of their face, and then for future generations you could say, this is what he looked like. And Thomas Jefferson had one of those done when he was 33 years old, which is how old he was when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Now, 
He became president in his late 50s, and then in his early 60s, some people said, you've aged, you should have another one of these done. So, Bor so Jefferson agreed to have this done, and this, the way the story goes is that the guy doing this life mask, the artist, didn't know what he was doing, had never done one of these before. So he puts this stuff on Thomas Jefferson's face, and Thomas Jefferson couldn't breathe. And, and he started to panic. He couldn't breathe, and he reached out and he grabbed a chair. He's lying on his back, and he shakes this chair and kind of with you know, motions kind of gets them to understand, I can't breathe. So they actually had, with the stuff had started to harden, and they had to remove it with a hammer off of his face. Plus, plus, Apparently you were supposed to put some kind of oils on the skin and he didn't do that either so then they had to peel this stuff off and it removed skin from his face and so the way the story goes Thomas Jefferson said I'm never doing that again and so we have a life mask of him at age 33 but there isn't one that exists of him at an older age. Now, <clears throat> there's another question that sometimes people say is why does Jefferson seem to be looking upward whereas the other three are kind of looking at, you know, straight out. What's that about? And there will be some people that'll say Jefferson was, that Borglum did this for Jefferson because Jefferson was a visionary, a philosopher. He's looking to the heavens, you know, that kind of a thing. But there's actually a more practical reason. As they were working on the mountain, the men came down and they, to tell Borglum there's a big crack in the granite up there. And if we keep going, that crack will end up going right across Thomas Jefferson's right nostril. And Borglum was worried that if they did that, that 50 years, 100 years, 500 years from now, Thomas Jefferson's nose might fall off. <laughs> so Borglum went back in the studio and he took Jefferson's head and he kind of turned it a little bit and then he tilted it backward about five degrees and what that did was it moved the crack from his nostril to his cheek. And in the process, Jefferson's line of vision or his gaze went like this as you tilt his head back five degrees. And that's why he seems to be looking to the heavens. But there's a, just a more practical reason there. Now, another thing people sometimes miss is they started working on Abraham Lincoln's left hand. He was supposed to be grasping the lapel of his jacket like this and so you can see where they started working on his fingers and that sometimes people miss that. Another thing that people talk about is Teddy Roosevelt wore glasses. How do you do, how do you carve glasses in granite? So Borglum did something creative. He carved a little nose piece and then little lines under each eye. When you and I look at this, we see glasses, but they're not there. Something kind of a neat way of doing it. Now, there, when you look at Mount Rushmore, you can see all this rubble underneath the mountain. That's the, that's the rock that came down from the mountain, and it was, Borglum's idea was that that would be removed eventually, but they never had the money. So it sits there today, and that is the rock that used to be up on the mountain, and now it's lying on the ground. Borglum, uh, just about at the end, but Borglum, his dream, uh, another kind of famous quote from him. He said, I want somewhere in America a few feet of stone that bears witness to things we accomplished as a nation, carved high as close to heaven as we can, then breathe a prayer that the wind and rain alone shall wear them away. The geologists that study this say the rock on Mount Rushmore is going to erode at the rate of about one inch every 10,000 years. So this is going to be there for a long, long time. And as it says on the screen, I've reached the end of my presentation. I thank you so much for your listening this morning. Thank you.